Hello everyone, you're through to St Mark's Online. Greetings in Jesus' name. This video uploaded for Sunday the 18th of April, AD 2021. I'm Jonathan Fraze. Let me begin with this great hymn of Charles Wesley. It's called Christ whose glory fills the skies. And it goes on. Christ, the true and only light, son of righteousness, arise, triumph over the shades of night. Day spring from on high be near, day star in my heart appear. Dark and cheerless is the morn unaccompanied by thee. Joyless is the day's return till thy mercies beams I see till they inward light impart, glad my eyes and warm my heart. Visit then this soul of mine, pierce the gloom of sin and grief, fill me radiancy divine, scatter all my unbelief, more and more thyself display, shining to the perfect day. And with that focus of Christ, and knowing that we are safe in his hands, we join together in the words of confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy on us, spare those who confess their faults, restore those who repent as you have promised through Jesus Christ our Lord, and grant, O merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a godly, righteous and disciplined life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the set prayer for the second Sunday after Easter Day. Almighty God, who gave your only Son for us, to be both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly life. Give us grace so that we may always receive with thankfulness the immeasurable benefit of his sacrifice and try day by day to follow in the steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a psalm. This one, number 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples with equity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the passage to be the basis for our study together. 
Romans 1 verses 8 to 15. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now and last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have now been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your glory our supreme concern. For Christ's sake. Amen. 24th of May, 1738, was the day that John Wesley, aged 35, a Church of England clergyman, experienced the new birth in Christ. It was ten years after his ordination to priest or presbyter, and in his diary he wrote, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate, that's City of London, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change that God works in the heart, through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Please notice, what was read was not the Bible, nor a commentary on it but merely an introduction to such a thing. Remarkable. Uh, Samuel, John's father, was pastor in an independent church, but had moved into the Church of England and became rector of Epworth in North Lincolnshire. John's brother Charles became a great hymn writer. But it was John's trip to Georgia in the first states established across the Atlantic that taught him what he was missing. He had set out for America three years before his Aldersgate experience. And he was on a ship carrying 80 English colonists who were there to settle and 26 Moravian Christians from what we would say is now the Czech Republic. John got to know the Moravians, appreciating their radiant joy and deep devotion. This was especially apparent one night just as the Moravians had begun their evening psalm singing. The windswept sea lashed at the ship, ripping the mainsail and pouring through the decks. The English passengers were screaming, but the Moravians kept singing. Weren't you afraid? John asked one of the Moravians when the storm was over. Weren't your women and children afraid? No, the Moravian gently responded. We are not afraid to die. After the ship landed, Wesley continued similar conversations with a Moravian pastor named Spangenberg, who launched some challenging questions of his own. Have you the witness within yourself? The pastor asked John. Does the Spirit of God witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? Wesley didn't know what to say. Do you know Jesus Christ? The pastor pressed. 
I know he is the saviour of the world, replied John. True, the Moravian responded, but do you know he has saved you? So that set it up. And three years later was Aldersgate, and then for the next 53 years, John preached the new birth across the length and breadth of the land, riding an estimated 250,000 miles on horseback in the process. He did not intend to found a new group that would separate from the Church of England, but bishops often disliked his enthusiasm, that was the word used, and forbade their clergy to loan him their pulpits, even telling church wardens to lock the doors when he came. As a result, he spoke mostly outdoors, including the uh, areas of East Sussex at Northiam and Rye and uh, Winchelsea, where a tree commemorates his last outdoor sermon six months before he died. He left tens of thousands in house groups known as methodical clubs for the way people confess their sins openly. And that became, of course, the Methodist Church. The cold welcome from Anglican clergy may be explained by their emphasis on decorum and good order. As the character Edmund Bertram says defensively in Mansfield Park, published in 1814 by Jane Austen, herself the daughter of an Anglican rector, a clergyman cannot be in a high state or fashion. He must not head mobs or set the tone in dress. But I cannot call that situation nothing which has the charge of all that is of first importance of mankind, individually or collectively, considered temporally or eternally, which was the guardianship of religion and morals, and consequently from the manners which result from their influence. Do you get the point? You see, uh, the Church of England had come to emphasise Christian conduct over faith. Christian as an adjective rather than a noun, making it a matter of heart rather than, uh, excuse me, that's the point, isn't it? Not of heart, but uh, merely of, of hand. Rico Tice, contemporary Anglican clergyman and author of the Christianity Explained course, laments John Wesley was the greatest evangelist we ever had, and we shut him out. So Wesley was helped by Romans. And we continue our study of it today. Our main point is that the gospel is for everyone. I look upon all the world as my parish, said Wesley. In Paul's terms, this is for Jew and non-Jew, or Gentile, or non-Greek and Greek, if you want to put it the other way around, with Greek standing for the Gentiles around. I'm one of those who claims that Paul was the first internationalist meaning that his extensive travels for good set up that vision of life. Such is, the, such, such is the impact that today we believe we have a responsibility to care for others, not just across the nation, but internationally too. Even if we forget that this vision came from the gospel of Christ through Paul. Three things show us why a man such as Paul is honoured to be called a servant of Christ, which was an amazing title because in the past, just as today, people love the grandeur and, and the great titles for themselves. First, Paul says he is a worshipper. You and I are often reminded today that we are supposed to be consumers, that is the modern mentality. In the infant New Testament church, people were told to be loyal members of the Roman Empire. But the reality is that we have a greater calling of a loving God, the Father, who made himself known through the Son. So Paul starts by saying, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. It's a wonderful word of appreciation, isn't it? Then the Apostle uses a word, serve, which is part of the temple system of old, which is replaced by the church as a temple of the Holy Spirit, believing Jews and Gentiles held together by the mortar of love. So Paul, as we heard, says, God whom I serve, there's the word, with my whole heart, in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness 
how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And Paul says, I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So the first thing Paul says is he continues his introduction in Romans is that uh, I am primarily a worshipper like you. I'm someone who says I'm called to serve, to offer divine service, which is my whole life. Second, Paul describes himself as a builder. Paul is a preacher, a man of prayer and the word, a herald who builds up the body of Christ, adding strength by teaching truth to give deep foundations in the knowledge of who God is and what he's done. Paul writes, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Here's the key point, to make you strong. That is, that we might be mutually encouraged in faith. And Paul corrects what was clearly some misinformation going round that he doesn't care and never really intends to come. He says, I, I don't want you to be unaware. I really have planned to come. I just keep being prevented from doing so. And if you read the end of 2 Corinthians with his um, shipwrecks and his being assaulted by bandits and his floggings and his imprisonments, you'll see that his uh, own resume or CV is quite remarkable for the sufferings in the name of Christ he endures. I think some of those might have been involved in um, preventing him getting to Rome. But he wants to be with them and have a harvest among them. You see, Paul is a, a, an evangelist of many aspects. He will be a groundbreaker, a seed sower, a plant waterer, a weed extractor, but also a harvest reaper. In short, he is there to build. And thirdly, of my three brief points, I identify that Paul makes for himself, he is a debtor, a man in debt. So what drives this spiritual man given to constructing the church of Jesus Christ, using the gospel and the power of the spirit? He says, I am bound. That's my word to emphasize. I'm bound. I'm tied to this task bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, both to those who think they're terribly clever, both to those who think they're not. It's a blessed bondage, a smiling slavery, a delightful debt. And that is why I'm so eager, the word is literally sort of single-minded or focused, to preach the gospel also to you. If you think back to Matthew 18 and uh, the Lord Jesus parable of the unforgiving servant, uh, Paul would say he's the man with the unpayable debt who is released from his obligations. But unlike the ungrateful man in the story, he now runs round to everyone else saying that God is the ultimate compassionate creditor who has found a way to release us from a deadly peril. And that's what thrills him. This is Paul, worshipper, builder, debtor, just as Wesley would be. Paul was going to Nero's Rome in AD 57. He would be armed only with a message and he would die there, many scorning him. But he would inspire many others, such as John Wesley. And today, people call their dogs Nero and their sons Paul. Let's pray. Loving God and Father, please continue to build deep foundations of Christian identity within us that we too, like Paul, like Wesley, like others, may say that we are worshippers, builders and debtors to grace. For your name's sake. Amen. Well, it is a magnificent response to say, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Such a list of wonderful truths. And the Lord's Prayer or family prayer just keeps us close to Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We turn to intercession, beginning with the Church. Gracious God, we pray for your people worldwide. Bless every pastor, evangelist and lay officer with faithfulness and courage in their work. In particular, saving Lord, we pray for Kevin and Jennifer. With the country they want to get into again closed to foreign nationals, uh, they remain offshore but able to contribute to Asia Bible School with many students from a variety of nations and several languages in use. Almighty God, we ask that you sustain such a project and people in the missions field still with many unanswered questions, but also in particular that you protect those persecuted for the faith and who stand for Christ for instance, in communist regimes in North Korea and China. And we think, Lord God, of the uh, people in Hong Kong today, which, like the rest of China, uh, has many Christians, and uh, Hong Kong uh, losing its sense of independence. May many of those who oppose Jesus convert to Christ, like Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the mighty preacher of the faith he once despised. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the world. Sovereign Lord, please help nations to work together at this time of COVID-19. And may many find their future life shaped by the hope we have in Christ. We pray for those who, in addition, have the stress of living in a war zone, thinking today of Syria, now 10 years into civil war, but also Mozambique, newly flaring up. Please assist those who work for peace and who bring aid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide the Queen, particularly in her widowerhood, the royal family and prime minister, and everyone in government. And we pray for doctors, nurses, other hospital staff, hospice and rest home staff, chaplains, their teams, for strength, for protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember our community and parish. Loving Heavenly Father, our refuge and strength, we pray for the peace and prosperity of our neighbourhood, for refreshment for all key workers, for those who are getting back to running businesses and compliance with uh, new rules and developing new methods of operation. In addition, please bless those Christian projects to assist the needy, such as Bexhill Food Bank, Bexhill Street Pastors, Bexhill's Homeless Unity Group, and uh, Christians Against Poverty in Bexhill, as they minister to the vulnerable. May their staff grow in the knowledge of God and be strengthened in power to bear fruit in every good work, abounding in insight and discernment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we do not forget the sick. God of compassion, we remember those who struggle in body, including with COVID and a long COVID in its various forms, but also who struggle in mind and anxiety and spirit and deep restlessness of soul. We remember the lonely and ask that you bless all carers in their strategic work, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Quietly or aloud, we name those who need our prayers today, especially continuing to remember Matthew Ema. God of all comfort, we thank you for those who have fought the good fight of faith to the end, giving you thanks for the life of Annie Tarbert, whose funeral is tomorrow, and pray for comfort and peace for those who mourn. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty, everlasting God, we praise you for bringing us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that we fall into no sin, nor run into any kind of danger, but govern and guide us at all times to do what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Junior Church reopens this Sunday. So that's a, a great thing. And uh, we uh, look for the, uh, God's blessing upon the young people we have and those who teach them. Delighting to know that from an early age we can open the Bible and find Christ. Here's another Charles Wesley hymn. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued? Amazing love! How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore, let angel minds inquire no more. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, not virtual but real, the Son, unmasked in the Gospel, and the Spirit, not socially distant, be among you and all whom you love, both near and far, and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for remaining connected with St Mark's.